Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we're going to be reading True Kidnapping Horror Stories. I hope you enjoy them. I also want to thank Noetic Stories for reading the first story on this video. Make sure that you go check her channel out. It'll be in the link in the description down below. So now, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. Hi, I'm a 20-year-old female, and this is how I was almost kidnapped. I'm sure as kids, we've all had some experiences with kidnapping, but at 20 years old, you wouldn't think it could happen to you. I went to Walmart with my significant other, and we were in the electronics section. He was looking at gaming items while I was looking at phone cases and screen protectors. Out of the corner of my eye, I see this weird-looking man walk past my aisle and stare at me the entire way. Thinking nothing of it, I go back to focusing on what I was looking at. I see him pass my aisle three more times, and he stared at me the entire time. I just thought I looked funny, being the fact that I had a walking boot and some pajamas on. Then I watch him start speed walking towards me, and I freeze. I'm still bothered to this day with how I froze. I'm a current law enforcement student, and that wasn't expected from me. He was just about to be within arm's reach of me when my boyfriend comes over and instantly the man acts as if he was looking at the phone cases. Little did I know, my boyfriend was keeping an eye on me the entire time. After that, I thought everything was going to be fine. I mean, we only saw him a couple other times in the store, and we were fine. We checked out and walked outside to the parking lot. Me being me, I'm a fan of dark humor, so I make a joke to my boyfriend about this van I see in the parking lot and say, wouldn't it be funny if that was the guy? My boyfriend takes one look at the van and gives me a look of straight fear and says, Run to the car. That is the man. I was scared and irritated in the way I reacted. I don't know what I would have done if my boyfriend wasn't there. I suffered from PTSD from that experience for at least five months after. So creepy man who tried to kidnap me. Let's not meet. Again. I'm a girl. My mom was a horrible addict. She barely took care of me as a kid. At the time of this incident, I was around six or seven, so my awareness and understanding of things happening may not totally make much sense. This happened in the 90s. One night, my mother and I were on a car ride. I wasn't sure where we were driving, but it was late at night. I'm not sure what time it was, but I assume it was really late because there weren't many cars on the street, and I was sleeping in the back seat. I don't even remember getting in the car. My mom drove up some sketchy house and left me in the car for what felt like forever. Suddenly, the car door swung open, and someone violently grabbed me by my arm and yanked me out of the car. I started screaming and crying until the man that grabbed me looked in my eyes and said, Be quiet and don't try to run or I'll kill you. He had a scruffy beard and looked like a madman. I was scared to death, so I listened. He held me tight by my arm, shut the car door, and walked with me down the street. I looked back at the house my mom was in, hoping that my mom would come out the last second and save me. I looked at the house for as long as I could as the man dragged me further and further away. As we walked down the street, I wanted to cry, but I was in shock and in fear. I didn't know what to do. If I sniffled or cried, the man would tighten his grip and yell at me. I can't even explain how scared and confused I was. We walked for a little while and ended up in the projects. 
the projects were a bunch of buildings crammed together in a crappy neighborhood. We walked into the one of the buildings and walked up a flight of stairs. My legs and feet hurt, but I was too scared to stop moving or to complain. We walked up another flight of stairs when I saw some random guy smoking a cigarette in the stairway. Then, without warning, the guy that kidnapped me fell to the ground. It happened so fast. I don't know how the kidnapper fell to the ground so fast, but the next thing I remember is the cigarette guy was punching and kicking the kidnapper in his head and face. The kidnapper was out cold. Cigarette guy picked up the kidnapper by the back of his jacket and threw him down the stairs. You have no idea how scary and violent it is to see an unconscious man fall down the stairs. To this day, I still have a fear of falling downstairs. He bled everywhere. I still have no idea how cigarette guy knew to help me, but I'm glad he did. Maybe he could see the tears in my eyes. Maybe he just picked up on something and had a bad vibe but he acted instantly. The first second he could, he attacked my would-be kidnapper. Cigarette guy starts pacing back and forth, swearing at himself, gritting his teeth and clenching his fists. I thought he was mad at me, so I started to cry. He looked at me and said, Okay, 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 just shut up, shut up. He had an attitude, so I listened to him out of fear. I wasn't as scared of cigarette guy as much as the bearded guy, but I was still in fear of him. He started to ask me questions with an attitude. Why are you out this late? Where are your parents? Why would you talk to strangers? I was in so much shock and confusion that I couldn't answer the man's questions correctly. He asked me if I knew my way home and I told him I didn't. I told him a broken story about what happened and how someone with the information I gave him, he knew where my mom's car was. The only thing I can remember about the road is passing a house with Christmas lights on it despite Christmas already being over. I think he knew the area well enough and figured out where I needed to go from that information. But I honestly don't even remember telling him about the Christmas lights. Anyways... He told me he would take me back if I promised over and over that I wouldn't tell the police that I saw him or anyone that looked like him, and made me promise that I wouldn't even tell the police anything. He had an attitude. I didn't care what he asked me. I just wanted to go back to my mom. So I agreed. I followed him down the stairs. The bearded guy was still laying on the ground bleeding at the bottom of the stairs. That cigarette guy threw him down. He wasn't moving at all. For all I know, he was dead, and I hope now that he was. Cigarette guy stepped over the bearded guy and I followed. We walked outside, and cigarette guy looked around panicky. I remember him telling me, the police don't like me. We walked out of the projects, and my feet still hurt. Cigarette guy was walking fast in a panic, and I had to basically jog to keep up with him. I started crying, and he asked what was wrong. I told him my feet hurt, and I remember him sucking his teeth and picking me up with an attitude. He awkwardly cradled me in both arms. He walked down the road for a moment. Then I remember him swearing and running behind a house or a building. A cop car was driving down the road. He put me down and told me to run to the police car. I tried to run, but my legs could barely move, and I was scared. The cop car kept driving and rode away without seeing me before I could even get remotely close to it. He kept swearing to himself as he picked me up again and ran down the street. He took me behind a lot of houses and hid from every cop car that drove by. I assume now that the police were looking for me. He carried me in both arms, running fast down the road, when I saw my mom at her car in the distance. She was surrounded by police. Cigarette guy put me down and told me to run to the police. I got so excited that the pain in my legs disappeared. He put me down and ran away. I ran towards the police and my mom. My mom picked me up and hugged me tight. The police started to ask me and my mom questions. I don't remember too much about their questions, but I remember my mom telling the police some convoluted story that just didn't make any sense. 
She basically told me to not say anything, and I didn't say much, but I cried a lot. We went home. Days later, my dad picked me up and knew that something was wrong. I told him everything. I never lived with my mom again. When I grew up and had time to think about that day, I never forgave my mother. Not too long ago, I asked my dad what he remembers about the situation, and he told me what he thinks happened from what I explained to him from years ago. He said my mom was on a drug binge. I got kidnapped. Someone saved me, but the real person that saved me had warrants and wasn't mad at me. He was just frustrated at the situation that he had to deal with. Imagine being a criminal on the run, and now you have a kidnapped girl with you and you just beat a guy half to death. If he would have gotten caught with me, he could be in jail for my kidnapping. With my mom lying and me being in shock and confused, I wouldn't be able to tell them that the man helped me, because while it was all happening, I didn't even notice he was helping me. To the man that saved me, thanks. To the man that tried to kidnap me, let's not meet. I deliver pizza, and I'd been having a really busy night, non-stop back and forth, without any time to even pause and take a leak. I'd been so busy that I wasn't really thinking about bathroom breaks. But we're also going through a bit of a heat wave in our area, so I've been drinking copious amounts of water. All of a sudden, as I was driving to this particular delivery, the urge to go hit me. Like, things went from zero to sixty in an instant. Thankfully, I was close to the customer so could get this one over with quickly, or so I thought. I pulled up to the house, and it was an area I'd delivered in before, so I could immediately see that something wasn't right. All the lights were off in the house, not even the glow of a television or anything. It was extra apparent because the street light closest to the door happened to be out of order, and on top of it all, the block was dead quiet. This is a big university area and obviously there aren't many student renters in July, but there had to be at least one person because someone ordered this pizza. Maybe they just liked sitting in the dark, or they were out back in the yard, whatever. I just didn't want to get out of my car and knock on a quiet house in the middle of the night, around 9.30 p.m., without first checking that I had the correct address and the customer was inside. It was scorching that night, even after sundown, my car's AC is a joke, and the piping hot pizzas don't help things much, so I have to try and open the car door as infrequently as possible to keep any cool air in. I called the number the customer provided, and the voice on the other end said, kind of brusquely and out of breath, Yeah? I just tried to keep it clear and concise. Hey, it's your pizza out front, but there doesn't appear to be anybody home? And the customer replied, still gasping for air. Yeah, I'm not home. I had to pee so badly by that point that I was much less patient than I'd otherwise be with a customer right out of the gate. Well, then we're going to have to terminate the order because I've arrived in the stated delivery window and you were supposed to pay in cash. So, I don't know what to tell you. Plan ahead next time. I instantly regretted letting my bladder do the talking for me as the voice on the other end came through more clearly as a young, bubbly, and very distraught girl who couldn't have been older than 20 or 25. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry I was running down the street so I could barely hear you. She cried. I just switched you out of my AirPods. Is that better? Sorry, I completely lost track of time at work, but I knew you were coming. That's why I'm literally running home right now. Please don't leave. I'm starving and I don't have a car. Seriously, please don't leave. Five minutes tops, okay? I know what it's like to be hungry and running late and have no car but not live near any restaurants. Plus, when I heard her voice, I began to remember more specifically having delivered to this place a couple times before, and she'd always been perfectly nice. Now I felt bad for snapping at her. I tried to walk it back, while simultaneously looking out my window for potential spots to pee. No, no, my bad. I'm letting the heat get to me and it's not your fault. No need to rush. See you when you get here. I hung up, and, while surveilling the street, 
was starting to think I was really out of luck. All the other houses had people in them and were close together, so there were no clumps of trees or out-of-the-way patches of land or anything. Of course, I had just tossed my empty water bottle at the last delivery because I'm an idiot. Finally, I decided it was escalating to the point of an emergency, and the safest bet was to use a bush in front of the woman's house. She wasn't home. The street light was out, so no one would see me. The people who were home were inside. My car was parked across the street, and we're a small shop who don't wear uniforms. So, if someone did spot me, they'd have no way to connect me to my employer. Animals pee outside all the time. Humans are animals. This is fine. I scurried over to the tallest bush in her front yard. She didn't really have much of a yard. More just a walkway lined with bushes and flowers that ran adjacent to her front door. The biggest cluster of bushes. The only one where I could be sure there would be no visible splatter on the side of the house was about four feet from her door. I looked both ways, unzipped and let fly. After the initial millisecond of relief, I noticed the sound was way off. I started panicking, thinking I'd aimed wrong. But once I start, I can't stop midstream. So I kept squinting into the darkness to see if maybe I was hitting a key rock or something and could just move a few inches over. Instead, all of a sudden, I heard a way more concerning noise. A deep voice exclaiming, What the heck? And before I could turn around, assuming I'd been caught by a neighbor, a man came leaping out of the bushes. He blew by me, brushing my golden shower off him as did. He spit pretty emphatically on the ground, so I think I might have beamed him right in the face. I didn't see where he went after a few paces, but... Though this next part is kind of a blur, I do think I remember hearing a car screech out from a bit further away after a minute. I'd gotten some night vision by that point, so I was able to make out his height, build, and outfit, but only the most general details of each. I just stood there trying to figure out what had happened. The reality was so terrifying that my mind refused to accept it and impulsively searched for a reasonable explanation that could make everything okay. I thought, could these bushes lead to some backyard area and just look like they were against the house? Could they have been obscuring an open window? My inner voice was desperately screaming. That man was wearing a hoodie in 90 degree weather. That was a bad man. You're in a bad situation. But the very idea that I was within inches of a guy who would be hiding in bushes at all, let alone in front of a young woman's house at night, just wasn't something I was ready to grapple with yet. I was coping by not coping. My fight or flight response totally failed me at that point because my did the absolute last thing I should have done and approached the bushes to try and validate this. There must have been a good reason for a man in a hoodie to be behind these bushes in the middle of the night. Theory. So I walked over to the side, turned on my phone flashlight, and tried to peer around the line of shrubbery. Pro tip, as scary as things may look in the dark, Seeing them with a single beam of your flashlight can sometimes make it even worse. That's when I saw the bag. There was a tattered drawstring bag sitting behind the bushes, slightly splashed with pee. But I was in such a moronic daze from shock that I groped around for it thinking, see? This is it. This will explain why he was back here. It explained it. Once I maneuvered it over and pulled it open, I saw a sharp knife, a roll of duct tape, and a bottle of pills. The delusions officially broke at that point, and all the adrenaline, endorphins, and self-preservation instincts that had been suppressed kicked in ten times over. I became whatever the opposite of dazed is, more laser-focused than I have ever been in my life, with one singular goal. Get back to my car. I dropped the bag, booked it across the street, got in my car, and slammed the pedal to the floor before the door was even all the way closed. I went as far as I could as fast as I could until I hit a red signal. Then I pulled off to the side and realized I shouldn't be driving any more than necessary in the condition I was in. I pulled into the parking lot of a 24-hour drugstore and took a breath. I was finally calm and coherent enough to zip up and formulate a plan of action. My first lucid thought was, who do I call first, the police or the girl whose house that was? 
I thought about it for what couldn't have really been more than 10 seconds, but felt like an hour, and decided, okay, I am in my locked car with the engine running. If trouble starts, I can drive away. I know something's up. She might not. She needs to know not to keep walking in that direction. But as I was dialing her number, it occurred to me, what if there was no girl? I thought I remembered delivering to that house before, but what if I was wrong? What if the girl on the phone was just a decoy to get me there to rob me? Or worse, every pizza guy on the planet has seen the Evil Genius documentary by now. So I thought, she called me all out of breath. She wasn't home. The whole thing was off. Can't risk it. I'll start with the cops. The operator was very helpful in keeping me calm because I was a complete wreck by this point. He kept assuring me that someone would be there soon. I kept telling them they had to get there before the girl did, but I was trying to express three thoughts at once and really damaging my own credibility. It came out more as, you've got to save this girl because he wasn't after me. I was just delivering a pizza, unless they were after me, in which case there might not be a girl. But I talked to one on the phone, so then you should find that girl because they used her to lure me there. But if she's real, she doesn't know about the guy, who was also real. And there could be more guys if there's actually a girl. And you know what? Even if there isn't a girl there might actually be more guys. I only checked one part of the bushes so I don't actually know. I didn't mean to. This was back when I thought the girl was real but not home. But she might be real so you really need to find her if she is because the guy was real. Finally, they basically just asked me to stop talking and stay on the line, but that was when I saw an incoming call from the customer. I couldn't answer it without disrupting my 911 call, so I just ignored it. But then she sent me this text like, hey, I'm here, don't see you. I told 911 that she was there, and they said officers were only minutes away, but who knows how long that meant especially after I'd given such a scattered account of the events in my panic. I just felt overwhelmed with guilt, because my rational mind said the odds of her being a decoy girl for some large scam targeting pizza guys were low, and the odds of her being the intended victim of a predator were high. So I put my 911 call on mute, where I can hear them but they can't hear me, and turned back, heart absolutely pounding out of my chest, the entire way. Then I took 911 off of mute and told them I had returned to look for the girl. They weren't happy about that, but I saw her meandering past the parked cars in the street, looking to see if one was mine, and I waved her down, flashing my brights. She bounced on over to the window of my car, happy-go-lucky. I figured that was a good sign that she wasn't in on whatever this was, but I was just so scared to be back in the general area and to not know what had just happened or... What was going to happen? I kept whispering, get in, get in. And she was like, get it? Huh? Oh, you want me to get the pizza from the back? I didn't want to make the same mistake with her that I had made with 911. So instead of trying to tell the whole story, I stuck to the bare basic facts. There was a man in your bushes. I'm on the phone with the police. I don't know where he is right now. Please get in the car so we can lock the doors. I was barely able to get even those sentences out, and I was shaking like I'd had 10 cups of black coffee. I held up my phone with 911 on the call screen to verify it for her. I thought that was why she got in the car with no further explanation, but it turns out that wasn't entirely it. You still there? Is she with you? Are you safe? Is anyone else there? 911 kept checking in, not knowing who the third party that I was talking to was. I reassured them, and we drove more cautiously this time to a location that 911 told me to go to so that I could speak with police after they cleared the area. I didn't actually have to do much after that. The police came pretty soon after. A police car met us. I gave a statement telling them everything I observed, and she went to go speak to more officers in more detail than they needed me for. It turns out, the reason she got right into a strange pizza guy's car without probing any deeper into my story is because she knew who the man was right away from my description. She had an abusive ex-boyfriend who was apparently psychotic enough that he immediately came to mind from hearing, there's a guy in your bushes. 
She later called us to thank me and insist on leaving a huge tip. I wasn't there when the call came in, so the kid who answered didn't know to refuse to accept the money. But the manager already promised the next time we see her, we can load her up with enough one free pie cards to last a lifetime. Easily the scariest thing that has ever happened to me, on the job or off. I don't get the chance to tell the story much, because I try to avoid sharing it with anyone who could possibly know the girl, or know of the event. But I'm still not the same since. Even though I know he didn't even have anything to do with me directly, this truly shook me to my core. I'll start by saying I have a terrible biological father. He has been a shady person all of my life and constantly caused me a lot of grief. This is just one of those examples. When I was four, my parents split up. My mother and I moved states, and they agreed I would visit my dad every school holidays for a week. This one particular time, I had been with him for a few days when I was playing with my cousin at a nearby park. A car pulled up and I recognized the man as one of my dad's friends. He called me over and without thinking, I ran over to him and left my cousin at the park. He asked me if I could show him where my dad lived and I agreed and got in his car. I gave directions and didn't notice at all that they weren't following them correctly. Looking back, I didn't really know the way anyhow. After way too long, I did realize that we were getting closer to the city, which is far from my dad's house. We pulled up at a house I didn't recognize, and the man told me to wait in the car. I did, I didn't feel scared at all for some reason. He eventually took me inside, and I definitely started to feel unsafe then. I mainly remember two girls passed out with their tops off, and a much older man was feeling them up everywhere. I made eye contact with this man, and he made me sick to my stomach. I had definitely figured out that this was a bad situation by this point. A lady took me into a bedroom and brought me a sandwich. The bread was stale and I wasn't hungry, but I ate it all because I felt bad for her. Which doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's what I was thinking about. The lady told me a lot of things I didn't understand, but when she left, I remember thinking my dad was coming to pick me up soon. I fell asleep waiting for him. I wet the bed that night and no one came to see me the next day until I cried very loudly and banged on the door. The lady came back and yelled at me for stinking up her bedroom, and I asked about my dad. She said he was coming tonight after he finished work. She didn't offer me a shower or a bath, so I sat in my soiled pants all day. After that, everything turned into a blur, really. My dad did not come that night, and I was so terrified. In my head, I felt like I was there for months. I thought I was missing school and everyone had forgotten about me. In reality, I was there for five days. They let me take one shower. I don't remember eating much except for boring sandwiches, and I had chips and gravy once. Finally, my mom drove across the country to come and get me. After not being able to get a hold of me or my dad for so long, and then me missing my pre-booked flight home, she panicked and came looking for me. Thank God she did. She found my dad at his girlfriend's house, methed out completely hiding out. Turns out he owed a lot of drug money to the people who had taken me. They had told him that they had me, but he couldn't afford it or didn't want me back. Whatever it was, he didn't bother to try to get me back. My amazing mom paid his debt for him after borrowing from a lot of people, and she came to get me back. I remember when someone came into that room and told me my mom was here, and I walked out and I could smell her. It was the best feeling to feel safe again. She took me home, and I didn't see my dad again for a long time. She never called the police. My parents' relationship was very complicated then, and I fully understand the choices she made. I'm definitely okay now. I've spoken about this in therapy, and I've come to terms with most of the things that I went through as a child. But still, a messed up situation for a four-year-old girl to have to be in. So to my dad's friend, the sandwich lady, and even to my dad himself, let's not meet.
My best friend is an influencer. Not big time, but with a big enough following to get free stuff, and has gotten two sponsored trips. She still works a full-time job, but does the Instagram thing on the side, mostly because of the perks. She's not big enough to live off this yet. Anyway, this was her first trip. A little boutique hotel from Miami contracted her via Instagram and DMs and offered her an all-expenses-paid trip to Miami for Memorial Weekend 2018 in exchange for her to be in the hotel and take pictures and do a couple of stories. She was told she could bring a female friend with her if she wanted to, and everything would be paid for. This was her first time doing this, so at the time she wasn't really sure of how it worked. They send her a bogus contract for her to sign, and it said she'd be responsible for paying for her own plane ticket to Miami, and that she'd be reimbursed for it later. This was to prevent a no-show, meaning the influencer gets the ticket purchased by the hotel and the influencer never shows up. It seemed reasonable. She invited me, a gay dude, instead of a female friend because she was nervous about the whole thing. We figured it wouldn't be a big deal. And worst case scenario, they don't want to pay for my plane ticket. She'd just cover it for me and that's it. We were supposed to be picked up by the hotel airport. So the day comes and we arrive to Miami. There's a guy holding a sign with her last name. And the paper has the hotel logo. We're greeted and we're escorted to a black SUV. Here's where it gets weird. As soon as we're going to get in the car, the driver is visibly upset. We thought that he was talking to the guy who walked over to us, but he was talking to my friend. He had a very thick accent and was wearing dark shades. He was telling my friend that she was not allowed to bring her boyfriend, me, and that she said it was two girls. Two girls. The hotel told me two girls. Not one girl, one guy. Two girls. He was demanding to see where the other girl was. We were speechless and confused. The guy who walked us to the car looked annoyed, got in the passenger seat and started to fight with the driver in Portuguese. Then he turns to us and asks us where the other girl is at. My friend tells them very upset by now that there is no other girl, that she is at username, and that I'm just a friend coming with her on the trip. The big guy in the passenger seat gets out tosses our luggage out of the car and says something like, this is some crap. Gets in the car and they take off. That was it. We were in utter shock. Utter and complete shock. My friend immediately emails Melissa, the PR person we had been in contact through email with, to tell her what had happened. No response. We decide to take a cab and show up to the hotel. When we show up is when everything made sense. The hotel had been rebranded and had a completely different name, owner, and staff. We showed them the Instagram and is indeed the Instagram of the hotel that it used to be, but not the new one. They never contacted us. They never did anything. Whoever was in charge of the old Instagram account for the hotel did, or whoever got a hold of it did. Mind you, this was a somewhat big hotel account with 10,000 followers. It was real. But upon further inspection, we realized that the pics were really old, and so were the posts. My friend felt like an idiot and would not stop crying. We called the police, met up with a detective. Nothing ever came out of it. They investigated who was running the account before or who had access to it. None of the people who used to run that account had anything to do with it. Nothing ever came out of this. It's upsetting and scary to know that whoever wanted to abduct my friend or any other girls by using this old hotel Instagram knows who my friend is. That Instagram has since been deleted and we never heard anything from anyone ever again. But to think that my friend would have been kidnapped had she gone with another girl instead of me sends chills down my spine.
I've stalked this sub for a while and couldn't decide whether or not to post mine, but I'm feeling brave on a Monday. It was a very long time ago, back in 1973. I know it was summer, I was six, and we were living on Monica Lane in Madison, Wisconsin. Thing is, I sort of recalled it but never put two and two together until a few months ago when I was talking to my mom who went into great detail. I was a very gregarious child, outgoing, extroverted, friends with anyone. It was at the time a middle-class neighborhood, and three houses down from ours, on the same side of the street, was a huge park. My mom was a nurse, and my dad was a salesman, but mom worked second shift at Meritor, while my dad worked days. I rarely had a babysitter, only if they went out for dinner or a movie, but they did go out often, and there were always older kids in the neighborhood to babysit. One sitter who I really liked lived a few blocks or so away, and down the street a little bit. Vicky had babysat a few times before that, and it was pretty uneventful. She'd play games with me, and do my hair, play dress up, pretty basic stuff. So anyhow, one day I had gone with friends down to the park. I remember there was a ball field at the time, and a sand lot next to the field. My friends wanted to play on the monkey bars, but I wanted to play in the sand. I looked at the sandbox, and my babysitter Vicky was standing there. I told my friends I was going down to, to the sandbox, and ran off. We played in the sand, building a castle, and then she asks me if I wanted to go get something cold to drink. It was stifling hot, and I of course said yes. So she takes my hand, and we start walking to her place. She starts telling me about her puppies and asking if I want to play with them. Of course I get giddy and now can't wait to get to her house. This was where my memory had stopped, and after my mom told me what happened, the rest of it flooded back. My mother just happened to be talking to my sister and I about some of the places we lived, and we got to Monica Lane. I told her I remembered the park and how big it seemed, and she asks me if I remember being kidnapped. I immediately thought she was kidding, and then the look on her face told me otherwise. She said it was around 5 in the afternoon, and one of my friends had come to the door to ask me to come back outside, sure that I had gotten bored and walked back home. When my mom checked the house, she realized I wasn't there, and, seven months pregnant with my sister, sprints to the park, screaming my name. After asking several kids if they'd seen me with no clue, she went to the ball field and asked the older boys if they'd seen me. One of the boys, she guessed around 14, said that he'd seen a younger woman playing with a girl that fit my description in the sand and walk off in a general direction, and that was all he knew. My mom ran across the street to one of the houses and asked to use their phone and called the police. By the time the police got there, my dad had come home and some of the neighbors were trying to help my mom. So there's this search party out looking for me, screaming my name and knocking on doors. The police had gone back to the park to ask the boys if they knew who had been with me and if they knew who she was. Between the boys and the neighbors, they had deduced who it was that had led me off but I have no idea how, honestly. The police and the entourage go to her home. She lived with her parents, but they weren't home, and knock on the door. She came to the door and told them she hadn't seen me and that she'd been home all day. The police asked to come in, and for some reason she said okay. They went through the house and went to the basement and found me. That's what my mom knew, and then I remembered. It was literally like a floodgate had opened and I started crying. At six, you sort of trust everyone, and she'd been in our home. I never got a bad feeling from her, and my parents didn't either. But when we walked into her house, I remember that cold, holy crepe feeling washing over me and getting very worried. I remember starting to cry and saying I wanted to go home, over and over. She takes me into her kitchen and gets me a glass of water and a tissue. I hear dogs barking and next to the kitchen is an open stairway that goes down, and where the barking was coming from. She starts trying to cajole me into going downstairs, telling me there's all sorts of toys and games. I reluctantly agree, and she grabs my hand to head down the stairs. The dogs are going nuttier and I start screaming. At this point, Vicky is getting bizarre. She's screaming at me to shut up, 
If you don't shut up, I will throw you in the cage with the dogs and they will eat you. Shut up. Dragging me down the stairs and still screaming. I was scared out of my mind. I remember crying so hard I was hyperventilating. And I am screaming so hard I'm not making sounds. Vicky then flips a switch and starts being syrupy sweet, trying to calm me down. She tells me that she was just playing a game and tells me she wants to play hide and seek. She must have been relatively skilled at calming me down, because the next thing I know, I hear knocking on the door upstairs, and I wasn't crying. The houses were all the same sort of tract houses that Sears used to sell. Not huge, but not small. But you could hear everything at any spot in the house. I keep hearing the knocking, and she tells me that it's her friends. They're coming to play hide and seek. She convinced me to let her put a piece of masking tape over my mouth so I wouldn't make a sound, and lifted me into this big wooden box next to the kennel. She put a big pile of blankets over me and told me to be really quiet so they didn't find me. The whole time the dogs were going crazy, but when she calmed me down, they calmed down too. They still looked incredibly mean, but they were no longer frothing at the mouth and only slightly growling. Until the knocking started, I remember scrunching in there, confused, still scared and convinced that the dogs were going to get out and eat me. I was crying again and hyperventilating. I remember taking the tape off my mouth because I couldn't breathe, but remembered I needed to be quiet because I was afraid what she'd do if I screamed. I laid in that smelly box next to a big bag of dog food, sweating, tears rolling down my face. I sort of pushed the blankets to the side, but only enough so that I could pull them back over me when someone came. I recall thinking about my dad and wondering if he'd come find me. All of a sudden, I hear what sounds like adults yelling my name. They come down the stairs and the dogs are going crazy again. Over and over, men are yelling my name. And then I hear a man say, If you don't shut those dogs up, I will. I was in a large storage box, like a carpenter's toolbox type of thing with tape hanging off my mouth when they opened the lid. I remember a very nice man asking me my name and if I was okay. I don't remember answering him in anything other than screams and tears and grabbing his neck so hard my dad had to practically pry me off of him. I remember my parents taking me to the hospital to be checked out, and that's all I really remember. Mom said that Vicky was found guilty of attempted kidnapping, and last she knew was in prison but couldn't remember when the last time was she had heard anything. We moved from the area shortly thereafter, and I haven't been back since. I do know that mom said that her parents were odd, but that they didn't know them. She had met Vicky from neighbors that had used her as a babysitter, and had never heard of anything bad, and that I always seemed happy with her. She lived in the general neighborhood, but it would have been two blocks over and on block down. Mom said they never picked her up, she always walked over. When they'd get home, they'd drive her home, but never noticed anything out of the ordinary. Mom and Dad had only met her parents when they came to the door to ask for forgiveness, that Vicky hadn't meant to do anything bad and was a good girl. Mom said my dad picked up her dad by the shirt and told him that if they ever came on our property again, he'd kill them. I remember her name and sort of what she looked like. But if she walked up to me today... I would have no idea who she is. This happened around 2006, when I was in my mid-twenties, and my sister, the unfortunate main character in this story, had just turned 21. At the time... She and her boyfriend lived with my fiancé and I. On weekend, we would go out to one of two bars that had karaoke, air hockey, etc. This particular night, we were at the bar further out from where we lived in the city, a good half an hour by car. Everyone was having drinks, socializing with people we knew. It was one of those places with lots of regulars. We were singing karaoke. Nothing out of the ordinary, really. Except that night, my sister started hanging out with these two older ladies who had a liquor store in their purses and were quite sharing, although I didn't know it at the time. 
as she tended to drink a lot more than me. That was a score for her. Less money spent on drinks. But she ended up far more hammered than usual. Towards the end of the night, around 1.45, she was really very drunk. The aforementioned fiancé, my sister's boyfriend and I were in a heated air hockey game, planning to leave as soon as it was over. She walked up to us and said she was going to smoke a cigarette outside. Nothing unusual. Everyone did. Until we were done. About five minutes later, we paid our tab and walked out. But she was not on the porch area where smokers congregated. Okay, weird, but not alarming. We went out back of the bar to check for her. Inside, in the restroom, in the large parking lot. It is notable that this particular bar was in a business park, so there were multiple businesses that were closed, as well as the Mexican restaurant next door that had just closed as well. We searched, asked everyone that knew us and those who didn't if they'd seen her. No one had. I asked the workers from the restaurant that were sitting outside as well. They seemed nervous when telling me they hadn't seen her, but I didn't think much on that until later. By then, I was in a full-on panic after trying to call her cell about 15 times, only to have it go to voicemail. Me, being a bit inebriated myself, I started searching for her. Went as far as to take off my heels and start running down the highway searching for her, as honestly there had been times that she would start walking home in the past. Though never from this place, as it was so far away from where we lived. The fiancé and her boyfriend thought we should go to the house, to see if she got someone to bring her home. It seemed unlikely, but not unheard of. We get home and she's nowhere to be found. Just as we were about to head back, and I was going to phone the police, I received a call from the PD on my phone. They indicated that they had my sister that there had been an incident and that I needed to get down there. We rushed to the PD, where we were taken into a room with my sister. Her face was red from obvious crying, and bruises were starting to show on her arms and chest. She said that when she told us she was going outside, she thought we said we were leaving then, so she walked to the car. After a few minutes, being drunk and tired, she sat down up against it to wait. A van pulled up, and a young man was asking her for directions to somewhere. She walked closer to try to explain, when suddenly the back door flew open, and two other men grabbed her and threw her in, taking off. They were rough with her, hitting her a few times while holding her down, saying they only wanted money. They snatched her purse from her, breaking the scraps, and searched it, quite haphazardly as they didn't find the $30 that she had in it. After driving around a bit speaking in Spanish, she couldn't understand, they pulled out a gun, making sure she saw it and put a bandana around her eyes, telling her that they'd let her go. She was driven to some woods by a neighborhood that she did not know. The door was open and they pushed her out, telling her to run, that if she took the blindfold off or turned around, they'd shoot. She ran and ran. Eventually, she did take the blindfold off and came to the first door she saw, beating on it and screaming for help. The police were called. She was picked up. And now, we are back to my being there, hearing what I feared had happened. A report was filed. Police did a search and did locate the bandana she ripped off. But as she was so intoxicated and terrified she was not able to give a clear description of the van other than a white older model or the three occupants other than young Hispanic men. The investigation turned up nothing as no cameras caught any of this. Heck, we even had detectives in our home who said, look, we need the truth. If you got drunk and just went home with someone and didn't want your boyfriend to find out, we will file charges on you. Aside from the bruises, broken purse, and her trauma, There was nothing concrete to go on. That was unpleasant. I am still fairly convinced that someone at the restaurant knew something, given their suspicious behaviors when I asked about her. But the police were never able to find that link. All said and done, the guys were never found. 
Eventually, we just moved on in different states. It's now just a story in our lives. It still makes me sick thinking of what could have happened, but thankfully it didn't. Be safe out there, everyone. I am a 21-year-old girl taking her first backpacking trip around the world. I only arrived in Thailand two days ago, and it was an unfortunate, as I almost got kidnapped on my first night. I went to Bangla Road, which is well known, and had a few beers at a bar, and then went to a popular club illusion. I was having a good time, dancing and meeting people. In the club, I only had three drinks, tequila and orange juice. But at some point, I realized I was a lot more drunk than expected. I don't know if it was spiked, but I was dumb and had my drink on the table next to me while I was dancing, and it was very crowded. In total, over the space of three hours, I only had two beers plus three tequilas. Usually, that is an okay amount for me to be aware. I went to the bathroom and felt very intoxicated and threw up. Upon leaving the bathroom, a guy who I do not know grabbed my arm. He seemed young, and I asked him what was going on. He said that he would help me down the stairs. After we got down to the road, he dragged me down an alley and put me in his car. I was really scared at this point and didn't know how I'd gotten myself into such a bad situation so quickly. I'm very small and not very strong so it was easy for him to take control of me. He started driving and I kept saying no, 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 and to stop. But he said, don't worry, I'm taking you somewhere safe, which was honestly very scary. I had maps open, and we were driving out of Patong. Finally, after some time, I started telling him that I would throw up all over him and his car if he didn't pull over. This seemed to annoy him and he pulled over. The second he stopped the car, I got out and ran down the street. Luckily, there was a motorbike taxi who asked if I needed a lift, and I jumped on and told him where my hotel was. I could see the guy walking down the road after me as we sped away. We made it back to my hotel safely. Honestly, after that, I'm not going to any bars or clubs alone. I don't trust anyone and I'm feeling very vulnerable. At least it was a lesson that I needed to be a lot more careful. I'm just glad that I made it out. Okay. When I was 17... I worked in a large mall at Vans. I had a lot of creepy older guys come in and flirt with me, but one guy took the cake. One day, I was working the usual busy as heck Saturday nights, and there were four very tall men that asked for my help getting shoes. I worked in an outlet, so the store was large with tall racks. The mall I worked in was extremely popular amongst locals and tourists alike. The mall has some history with being a sex trafficking hotspot for context. So anyway, the men said that they were from Nigeria, and they were pretty chill at first, until they began to flirt. One man kept saying that he has a son in Nigeria, and asked if I wanted to wed him. I laughed because I thought he was joking, but suddenly he looked extremely offended. I was awkward, and began talking about the shoes. But the man interrupted me with saying how great his son was, and that I would make a great wife. At that point I grew uncomfortable, because I didn't want to be rude, so I asked for a co-worker to come over to take care of them, while I went to the bathroom. Everything was normal for the remainder of my shift. I clocked out, and I was waiting for my dad to come pick me up. I usually walked around the halls of the mall as I waited. The music was soothing, and all was calm. I walked past a restroom hall and saw figures standing in my peripheral. I glanced and saw that it was the four men from earlier. 
I was in full-on panic mode at that point, but I played it off. I smiled at them softly and kept walking so they didn't think that I was being rude. Sure enough, they began following me. I picked up my pace, hoping to find other people walking around, but there was no one. I was speed walking from the guys who were keeping pace with me. My thoughts were to just go to the bathroom so I could lose them, so I entered the next restroom hall. I walked slowly, thinking I had just lost them, but soon after I heard pounding footsteps in a hurry. I looked back, and they were coming right for me. I didn't think the bathroom was an option anymore, and I started yelling for help. I ran straight for the employee corridors of the mall, but when I got through the doors, a security guard met me on the other side. I bumped into him, and I never felt more relieved in my life. The men took off the other way, and the guard let me stay in his office until my dad came. Thank God for the guard. If he wasn't there, I probably wouldn't be writing this right now. Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. I also hope that you enjoy the extra rain at the end. Get a good night's sleep, everyone. And I'll read to you in the next video. Bye-bye now.